There are three ways you can give to support the love-focused, culture-changing, ever-evolving, community-building, Jesus-inspired work of the village. You can text the word GIVE to 404-998-8979, 404-998-8979, or you can give online at thevillageatlanta.com slash give, thevillageatlanta.com slash give, or you can mail a check to The Village Church, 3418 Dogwood Drive, Hapeville, Georgia, 30354. Now let's get ready to get better so that we can do better, so that we can be better. Let's have church. Well, good morning and welcome to The Village and Everybody Church. We are excited that you are with us and we're excited every week to think that people tune in and that they gain something from our time together means the world to us. Uh, Let me just give you some quick updates um, before the the lesson today about what's going to be going on over the next uh, couple of months. We are going to be back in our auditorium on September the 12th. Now, that's a little longer than than we had thought we would be out, but we are in the middle of some renovations that are going to go all the way through August. And so because of that, we are just going to start the Sunday after Labor Day. And we really wish everybody would just circle that on the calendar and plan to be with us on September 12th. We think it's going to be an incredible relaunching of the village and we want all of our friends and all of our village people to be there. So that's that's important. Second thing is we're going to, I think, have a park service in August. We don't have a date yet, but we do want to go back to the park one more time, have a wonderful service and have a picnic. And so be looking for that information because that's going to be coming out soon. And then the more immediate uh, concern is what are we going to do in July? Now, we're going to keep online every single Sunday. And let me just say, even when we start back to meeting in our auditorium, we are putting a priority on our online congregation. We want you to know that you matter. And so we're going to be doing everything we can to engage with the people who maybe physically can't or for whatever reason don't come to our our physical location. We're going to do our best to have engagement there. So that's going to keep on. But what are we going to do as far as meeting in person in July? I'm so excited to tell you we are going to have two home meetings at mine and Jane's house. And you're all invited. And so I want you to listen closely. And then you'll have to follow up with this next week. But I I just hope you'll do it. And I hope you'll do it quickly because these Uh, slots will be filled up quickly. And when we get the two nights totally filled up, we will think about a third night, but we really want to see how many we can get on these two nights. So here's the deal. We're going to have a home meeting at our house Tuesday, July 20th, and a home meeting at our house on Thursday, July 24th. And we'd love for you to come. It's going to be from 630 to 830. I think I'm going to be grilling hamburgers, hot dogs, maybe barbecue. I'm not exactly sure what the menu is going to be, but um, we want you to come to our home and be able to enjoy a meal with us and then to talk about the village, what it means to be a part of the village, and what we are hoping and praying about as our future, looking into our future. So please, if you're in, in the Atlanta metro area and you can Make sure you sign up. Now, how do you sign up? Well, we're going to have uh, events on Facebook posted next week. And so be looking for that. You're also going to, if we have your information, you're going to be getting an email from us next week. And with those two ways, we want you to commit to either the uh, 20th or the 22nd. Um, Another thing people have asked about young, young children and, and the truth is, we're not really going to be equipped for kids. So um, it's, you understand, it, it, our, our house isn't that large, and I think it maybe would be a little overwhelming if everybody brought kids. So no kids. We're going to have dinner and discussion, and it's going to be amazing. And you pick between the Tuesday or the Thursday, get on the list and plan to be with us. So that's real important. Uh, also, next week, we've got a special message from Stan that I think is going to be unbelievable. I'm very excited about that. But then for the balance of July and August, we are going to be talking to you like this every week. 
as we get closer and closer and closer to the relaunch. But we also are going to give you a little glimpse of what it was like in our old space by revisiting one of the most wonderful summer series we have ever done. And of course, in the summertime, a lot of times the attendance was a little lower. And so sadly, this was one of my all time favorite series of all time, fantastic. And uh, I think some of you missed it and I don't want you to miss it. And even if you were there for it, I promise, I've been watching these again and I am blown away at what is kind of clicking in my brain that I had not really been practicing that was talked about during the series. So we're going to be doing a series presenting kind of the best of the village, a series on happiness. And uh, we're going to be talking to you in person like this, and we're going to be presenting the message and we're going to run that through a lot of the balance of the summer as we're getting ready for our September 12th kickoff. I want to say one other thing, and that's a thanks to Stan for teaching two weeks ago. It was fantastic. And then thanks to Marshall. I was so pleased, proud, um, inspired, moved, challenged by Marshall's Father Day, Father's Day message. And so if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to find it and to watch it. It was really, really good. Well, I'm going to talk about crushing the dash. I'm going to kind of finish that up today. So before I start that, Let's just have a moment of prayer, okay? God, I pray for every person who's watching or listening right now. And I pray for whatever their concerns are in their life. I know some people are, they're crushing it right now and some people are really struggling right now. And uh, I don't want to be all uh, positive and upbeat and, and smiles thinking that everybody is just having the greatest time in the world right now because I know that's not true. I know some people are really hurting. So right now, I just pray for everyone, every person, right now in their situation, whatever it is, for those who are hurting, I pray that they will sense that you are with them, that you love them, that you are for them, that you're never going to leave them, that they're going to make it through. Whatever this is, they're going to make it through. And then for those who are kind of having a real great time right now, I pray that they won't get so focused on how great things are for them now that they will forget to look at others around them who maybe are hurting and that we will all look with empathy in our eyes towards those around who need help and will be willing to help. Thank you for the village. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this congregation. And thank you for this lesson now. I pray you'll teach us what we need to know. And I pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well. We talked about crushing the dash and we started this a couple of months ago and we've had some off Sundays because of being in the park and stand teaching and different things like that. But just to refresh your memory, the idea was if we knew we had like 30 days to live or like the Tim McGraw song, we wanted to live like we were dying, what would we do differently? And we talked about the idea that we would Stop procrastinating because that's that's dangerous if you're procrastinating and putting your life off. We'd stop procrastinating and we would focus on genuine love. We would want to love big. Those things I think we all can agree with. Those things make a lot of sense. But there's one final thing that I think I would want to really make sure was a part of my life. And I don't know if you can will this, but I sure believe it's something that is good if it can be a part of your life. And that's, I would want to walk humbly. If I knew I was going to die just very soon, I would want to get arrogance out. I would want to get judgmentalism out. I would want to walk in genuine humility. Now, I want to consider two things about that. And uh, this is maybe not rocket science, but these two things I want you to kind of get in your mind and kind of ask yourself the question, how do you relate to these two things? Because I think it's these two things are very unattractive if you get them wrong, but it can be the part of a beautiful life if you get it right. First thing I want to say about this idea of walking humbly, I think it means I've got to stop judging other people. Can you just say those words with me? Stop judging other people. If you're watching with somebody else, turn to them and just say, stop judging other people. 
That's a habit that's so easy for us to pick up. And many times we're not even aware we're doing it. It just becomes second nature to us. And some people, they are way over the top with this. They don't even recognize it at all. We are quick to see the problems, to see faults, shortcomings, screw ups in somebody else's life. And we have maybe a difficult time recognizing those things in our own on in our own lives. We are only looking and being judgmental of other people. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter seven in the Sermon on the Mount, verse one, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, when Jesus says, don't judge, what does he mean? What does he mean? Well, let me tell you what it does not mean. Because I think sometimes people get silly with this and they, they throw some things in with this that, that aren't really a part of this. Jesus is not talking about discernment. Every single day, you and I, we have to exercise discernment. He's not talking about judicial discernment, where a jury has to exercise judgment in a courtroom. I'm very uncomfortable doing that. I don't know that I'm very good at doing that, but I believe that might be a part of what we have to do if someone is on trial for a crime. We might have to exercise discernment. He's not talking about relational discernment. There are some people who are toxic. It doesn't mean that we don't love them, but we might have to restrict the amount of time that we spend with them because we know they suck the life out of us and they are pulling against who we want to be in our very best way. There are some people who feel dangerous. You know what I'm talking about. I've been around people in my life that maybe I enjoyed their company, but there was something about them that just felt dangerous and I need to exercise relational discernment and choose how and when I need to be with them. You parents know when you're in re kind of responsible for your kids when they're still younger, you always are looking at who is entering their lives and you're looking with a discerning eye because you don't want anyone who's going to hurt them and uh, adversely affect them growing into the people that they're supposed to be. That's parental discernment. It's important. I'm going to be kind to all people. That doesn't change. I'm going to love everybody. That doesn't change. But, but, but I'm going to exercise discernment. Every single day, every one of us faces different choices where we have to make judgment calls. Employers have to make judgment calls about the skill and the character of a job applicant. These are assessments that we have to make. And when Jesus says, don't judge, He's not saying sustain all critical analysis about life. That's not what he's saying. Here's what he is saying. When he says judge not, he is using the term judge in the sense of condemnation. He is saying don't condemn the other soul. Don't write them off. Don't think you understand everything about their situation. Don't condemn the soul of another person. You got it? Don't judge. Don't condemn the soul of another person. Don't think you have it all figured out. Don't write somebody off. It's wrong. It's wrong to not be pulling for other people, to not wish the very best for everybody, to rejoice in someone else's defeats or to rejoice in someone else's failures, to rejoice in their mess ups, to judge them instead of loving them. Jesus said that has to stop. That's not the right way to live. And he goes further and he says, this judgmental attitude, it's going to come back on you. I love the way the verse we read a moment ago is written in the paraphrase called the message. Listen to this, a little more contemporary reading. Don't pick on people. Don't jump on their failures. Don't criticize their faults. Unless of course you want the same treatment. Here's the line I like. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. Isn't that cool to think that's a different way of understanding that same verse, that critical way of thinking, that judgmental attitude that you have, that putting other people down when you do not know their story, that has a way of boomeranging and coming back and hitting you in the head. 
Jesus is saying that kind of arrogance is going to blow up on you. It's not the way followers of God want to live their lives. And he goes on to say in verse three, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that's in your eye? Where's your love? Your attitude destroys relationships. When you're judgmental, it creates distrust. There's no mercy involved in that. It is not what life is supposed to be like for those of us who believe we are living in the kingdom of God. So he says, remove the speck in, don't try to remove the speck in someone else's eye while you have the big two by four sticking out of your eye. You remember the old adage, church adage, you used to see it on bumper stickers that said, love the sinner, hate the sin. Terrible adage, I really think. That is kind of arrogant, kind of judgmental. And uh, I really, I've talked to people and they have given me this take on it. I think it's much better. How about just love everybody and hate your own sin? Hate whatever you're doing that's kind of messing your life up. Hate that, work on that, get better at that. But just love the other person. Don't sit in judgment of them. There's some speculation of what the board is Jesus is referring to when he says you're trying to get a speck or sawdust out of this person's eye, but you have a board in your eye. I thought this was interesting. Dallas Willard, he was an American philosopher, and he was known for his writings on Christian spiritual formation. He passed away a few years ago. But he said this, condemnation of other people is the board in your eye. That's the big plank that's in your eye. It's condemnation of other people. You are trying to see specks in other people's lives while you have this condemnation of other people coming out of your head, blocking your eyes. He said, the mere fact that we are condemning someone else shows our heart does not reflect the values of life in the kingdom of God. I love that because as progressive Christians, you know what? We don't believe that the kingdom of God is way down the road one day when we're in heaven we believe the kingdom of God is now. We are walking in the kingdom of God now. And if I'm living in the kingdom of God now, that means that I want to live my life in a way that's consistent with that kingdom. And that means not being judgmental. Condemnation and self-righteousness blinds us to the realities the other person is going through. We can't see clearly how to help our brother or sister because we don't really see our brother and sister. We see someone that we are ready to condemn. And we will never know how to truly help others until we have grown into the kind of person who doesn't condemn. Listen, I, I know I can be, I can slide into this judgmental spirit, but I also know it is a more beautiful life when I don't. When I try very, very hard to just love them, believing that I don't know their whole story, believing I really want the best for them, believing I don't want them to be hurt or punished. Very, very important. So if you're trying to crush the dash, I would suggest that you don't waste time judging others. And uh, I believe it's worthy for us to get rid of that habit right now. Just say, I'm not gonna do it anymore. We've said it at the village for years and years and years. We do the loving. If there's any judging to be done, let God do the judging. We do the loving. That's what we do. We do the loving. And uh, so very important. Um, people do it. By the way, we I've seen it on the left and the right. We are judgmental of people who hold different political beliefs than we do. And I, I'm telling you, it is just as um, toxic. Both sides, when we judge, you know, we see people who believe differently than us, when we judge them, it's toxic. And it's toxic when they turn around and judge us because we maybe see things politically different than what they see. Um, I've seen people who wanted to be judgmental about other religions. Listen, it's not, it's maybe not your faith. It's not the faith you grew up with, but it's a faith that millions and millions of people maybe are following. And it probably has some beautiful stories involved in it. And to sit in judgment, judgmental attitude about it just because it's different from you is not wise. I remember several years ago, it hit me. Christianity is 600 years older than Islam. And so when we would see terrible things that people did, number one, it wasn't representative of 
Islam. It was more representative of fundamentalism. But when we would see it done under the Islamic umbrella, Christians would just go crazy. And it's like, wait a minute, guys, do you remember what we were doing under the umbrella of Christianity 600 years ago? You remember things like the Salem witch trials? Do you remember things like people being pulled asunder because their beliefs weren't the same as those who were in authority? Do you remember those things that were done by Christianity? So if Islam is 600 years younger than us, maybe we should not be so judgmental of them. Maybe we should cut them some slack as well. Well, one more scripture I want to read about this little thing, and this is Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 1, Paul is listing things that uh, he's saying, this, these are what people are doing. They're, they're insolent, they're, they're gossips, they're slanders, all of these things. But then Romans chapter 2, he says this, verse 1, you therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on somebody else, for at whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. What he's saying is none of us should sit in judgment of anybody else because we all have our stuff, right? Don't you have your stuff? I have stuff. When I sit in judgment of somebody else, I'm ignoring that I've got stuff too. From the message, very same verses, listen to this. Those people are on a dark spiral downward. But if you think that leaves you on the high ground where you could point your finger at others, think again. Every time you criticize someone, you condemn yourself. It takes one to know one. Judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection in your own crimes and misdemeanors. Isn't that cool? He says, sometimes the reason you're judging and condemning and saying ugly things about people is because you're trying to hide what's going on in your own life. If I'm going to crush the dash, don't have time for it. Paul says at whatever point you judge or whatever point you condemn another person, you're really condemning yourself. Because really all of us, we all have the same kind of stuff. We all are involved in stuff that's maybe less than what we want to be involved in. Well, I remember reading this a long time ago, but it stuck with me and I've saved it in my notes. Your job, our job is not to judge. Our job is not to figure out if somebody deserves something. Our job is to lift the fallen, restore the broken, and heal the hurting. And if I've got 30 days to live or three months to live or 10 years to live, I want to be more about that than I am about judging other people. One more thing about humility. This is, I'm going to end quickly. But one more thing. I want to, if I'm going to be humble, it means I'm not judging, but it also means I've got to stop thinking I have the God thing all figured out. And I have to be willing to just trust and follow and love. Trust, follow, and love. I grew up in a church that I, I have great reverence for. I, some of the fondest moments of my life were growing up in this, this Baptist church. But there was a sense that if somebody had a different understanding of the Bible than we had, and I don't know if it was even explicitly said, but there was just a sense that if somebody interpreted it differently, then, then they were wrong. Maybe they were good people, but they were wrong because we had it figured out. So it didn't matter Maybe they were Methodist, or maybe they were Pentecostals, or maybe they were Presbyterians or Catholics. If they were in a different group with a different understanding, eh, they were wrong. So then I go to college and then graduate school. And there was still that, there was that same sense, maybe a little more, uh, maybe said a little more skillfully. But there was this idea that we were going to study God and systematically put God in these boxes then we would know God and anybody who saw God differently than us in our boxes, then they were wrong. They just were wrong. And so as I grew older, I began to realize, but wait a minute, some of the people who have inspired me the most, who have lived the most admirable of lives, they didn't fit into those categories of seeing it just like me. They saw it differently and that was okay. In fact, when I began to understand that, I became less enamored with the idea that I had to know all the answers, that I could somehow know everything about God. I can't. I, I may know a thimble, a thimble. If God represents the oceans, all the oceans, I probably know less than a thimble about what God is really like. 
And that's been helpful to me. And the older I get, the less I think I know and the more I think that's okay because I'm just trusting and following and believing in this God of love that has resonated with my heart. Sometimes people want me to tell them exactly what happens after someone dies. I'll let you in a little secret. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. A few little verses here and there. We try to make big deals about them. Truth is nobody knows. I, I don't know. And I can try to fake it and tell you this is exactly what's going to happen. But I would be not telling you the truth. Nobody knows. What I do know is God is love. What I do know is God's nature doesn't change and God doesn't arbitrarily do things outside of who God is. And whatever it is, it is loving because God is love. I do know that God's plan for our future is greater than any of us have ever thought. I know this because I really resonate. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, you've not seen nor heard nor even imagined anything as great as what God has prepared for you. I, I believe that. I believe that. I, so I don't know specifics, but I just know it's going to be wrapped in love. I believe if you're watching right now, and even for those who aren't watching right now, I believe their future is is destined to be better than they had ever imagined. The Bible says God has a future for us that's great. Revelation 8.18 says this, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. I don't understand exactly what that means, but it sounds to me like whatever hardship you're going through right now, your future is going to be better. It's going to be better. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be good. I believe whatever's happening in my life right now, in your life right now, God's going to give us strength. God will give us strength. My wife's favorite Bible verse is Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. God's mercies never cease. Great is God's faithfulness. God's mercies begin fresh each morning. So if I knew, if I knew, I had 30 days to live, or I made a commitment to crush the dash. I would want to stop procrastinating. I would want to love in a big way. And I'd want to walk humbly. Stop being critical of other people. Stop thinking that just because they're not on the path I'm on, that I'm better. Take my attentions off of that and just love them. And as it relates to humility, stop thinking that I have God figured out. I don't. I just know that there is a love there and I want to walk in that love and celebrate that love. And I think that's what you want to. Well, that's kind of my take on the crushing the dash. And I appreciate you sticking with us through that. We've got some cool stuff coming. So next Sunday, I'll be right here telling you how we're coming on the uh, home meetings and keeping you abreast of how things are moving towards the opening on September 12th. So make sure you're back with us next week. I love you guys very, very much, and I feel very honored to get to be a part of this. You have a beautiful day. Bye.